from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Mercifully, this billionaire, cash-drenched, gutless, issues-free presidential campaign is almost over. In the past, you know, we've decried the fact that neither campaign seems to have any ideas about fixing our public education system other than, yeah, make them charter schools. But today, we want to take on another thorny topic you'll never hear Mitt Romney or Barack Obama talk about with specificity, public housing. President Obama will never make a campaign stop in Chicago because he doesn't have to. But if he did, it wouldn't be at a public housing development. And if he did stop at a public housing development, it wouldn't be at Altgeld Gardens, located as it is so far south and encircled by pollution, industry, and garbage dumps. But if he did stop there, he probably wouldn't recognize the place. If you've read his biographies, you know that he was once a community organizer. Remember Sarah Palin's glee as she insulted him for that? Well, here's the important part. He did that community organizing at, of all places, Altgeld Gardens. And he wouldn't recognize the place today because about a third of it is unoccupied. The CHA has been very vague about why they're depopulating the place. They've been doing it for years, but they've recently announced to many people's surprise that they want to demolish the 648 units they've already emptied out. And another scenario just like it is playing out on the north side at Lathrop Homes, but that place is reported to be 82% empty. And this is at a time when the need for affordable housing in Chicago is greater than ever. So as we all know, the plan for transformation is now about 14 years old and it's resulted in the demolition of nearly all the high rises. They were hated by almost everybody, but these older, better planned low rise developments were thought by many people to be worthy of saving and maybe rehabbing. So it raises some interesting and critical questions. Is the CHA just giving up? Is the city getting out of the business of helping provide housing for poor people, the working and those who don't? And in this more conservative era, when it seems appropriate to tell poor among us that they should just get a job and go fend for themselves, is the whole concept of public housing a relic of another time? Is this just another one of those aspects of our lives that can easily be shoved into the, let's just privatize that category, even though the private market has never really been able to provide decent housing for people who don't make much money? Well, lots of questions on Chicago Newsroom today, and here to help us sort them out are Natalie Moore from WBEZ, Southside Bureau Chief at uh, Chicago Public Media. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. And uh, Eitan McKayley from We the People Media and the Residence Journal. Uh, two folks who have been on the program before. I'm so happy to have you back because I think these are people who really cover this stuff and really understand this in a way that many, many people don't. So if you don't mind, Natalie, we'll start with you and we'll start with Alt Gelb. Uh, I know you've covered it just recently. 600 and something re uh, units vacant. C CHA says they're going to tear them down. Will they? And if they do, why? My sense is that when the CHA puts something out in a plan, even if it's a proposal, that they will likely do it. And they're supposed to vote on uh, this plan in October. It's a board meeting. CHA has not been forthcoming about why they plan to tear it down. There is a plan for a retail center that's, uh, that would be in Altgale because as you eloquently said, in your opening there isn't a lot going around Altgale. It is an isolated Toxic area. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a reservation out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So retail amenities are greatly needed and I believe that they're saying well tearing that down will help built that. Mm -hmm. But I, my impression is that residents and people in the housing community were caught a little flat footed by the announcement. I have my own speculations about why CHA is probably tearing down Alt Gale. But sometimes the issue with CHA is that they just don't come out and make a compelling yeah. reason. You know, there, there could very well be a great reason that they think this is the way to go. Or maybe the public won't buy it as a great reason. Mm -hmm. But there isn't enough dialogue. It's just a few sentences in this massive report. Well, and when I've asked them, sorry. I haven't gotten, you know, really the kind of response that one would hope to get. One thing we know we don't have here is a situation like at Cabrini where for years the speculation was, oh, they just want to clear this out because the land is valuable and it's going to all be condos and all that. That ain't going to happen down there. It's, I mean, it's just not, it's, it's this little peninsula almost. And, and it's, it, it's not, it's not, they're not doing it because 
greedy developers want to get in there and build condos, right? No, and CHA does have the wherewithal to understand that that is not going to be a mixed income <laughs> community. <laughs> they have not tried to lure developers to build condos there because it just would not yeah. happen. Mixed yeah. income is struggling in some other pockets of the city and it would no doubt fail in a place like Augie. But I, I just want to make sure that my, I'm not misapprehending this, in, in the past before, well whenever, before the plan for transformation, I don't know what point you want to fix in time. There was a time until recently when Altgeld was pretty much full, right? I mean there, there weren't a lot of vacancies there. That's my understanding. Aton is with yeah, since yeah. the plan for transformation, the plan for transformation has had several iterations when it comes to Altkeld Gardens. Altkeld Gardens was originally slated to be a, a relocation, um, it was originally slated to be demolished and then it was repurposed okay. as a destination for people that were being relocated for other developments mm -hmm. and then it was repurposed yet again. How conscious these decisions were with the housing authority, I, I'd have to really look at the paper trail to see, mm -hmm, but I don't mm -hmm. think the housing authority has proceeded um, totally logically here. I know why they think that they want to demolish, uh, if that makes sense, why they why they are planning on demolishing um, units there is because they don't see Altgeld Gardens as a sustainable enterprise in the mm -hmm. long term, okay. which means that in terms of the money that comes to the housing authority from the federal government, they get a little bit less than what it actually costs to operate to the development. Uh -huh. So Altgeld Gardens is a place where a lot of rehab, tens of millions of dollars have been spent on rehabbing, I, I believe, the same units that they want to demolish, and it, it does seem odd that that um, that they would want to do that especially given the housing market the way that it is but the reality is that the current formula from the federal government means that they would have to do a substantial rehab 5 10 15 years down the road and and the money isn't there for that and, and so Aton knows yeah. this but CHA isn't coming out and saying this to reporters yeah, at board yeah, meetings or even yeah. in public right. yeah. meetings Right, and they, they have they, they have had, um, th there's a lot going on, as you know, inside the CHA. The, uh, we have, uh, uh, we're just passing the one year mark, right, for, for Mr. Woodyard, the new CEO. Coming up on that one year mark, yes. Um, and he, Charles um, Woodyard. there was a purge inside the, the staff of the mm -hmm. CHA this summer. All of the top people were, were uh, asked to leave and were replaced. Um, some of them were replaced. Or with, not replaced. Or yet. not replaced. <laughs> Um, but mm. some of them have been replaced with folks from City Hall. So I, I think what's happening here is that this is being fit into the grander design of the mayors. Um, ah, and okay. right now right. there's, there's the, the, the uh, well, we, we can get into it, but no, that's no, what I no, think No, 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 yeah. I, I, I think that I, this, is, this is something that we're seeing in so many ways. We're seeing it's very much parallel to what's going on at CPS. Right. Uh, purges and vacancies and uh, existing policy not being followed through with. So I mean, what you're saying is the people who put plan for transformation in place are no longer at the CHA. Is that is that a fair statement? They're now several generations out of the CHA. Okay. There, right. There, there, have okay. been, there have been several <laughs> other teams that have been moved through at this point. Yeah. And yeah. and what you really have is a clear deck in terms of, of uh, Mr. Woodyard is from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, they have a, a much smaller, much uh, uh, different uh, public housing system there. Um, the most um, radical, innovative thing that he did in North Carolina was to change all of the public housing there into what's called project-based vouchers, which is Boy, a... Boy, does that sound dangerous. It's an, it's an incredibly arcane um, uh, uh, maneuver uh, in the HUD regulations that essentially allows you to leverage a little bit more money from the federal government okay. toward that formula yeah. that I mentioned, but right. it doesn't actually result in any net change in the immediate future. I don't know if we're jumping around here, yeah. but but Natalie, you did some excellent reporting on your conversation with Mr. Woodyard about the one third, one third, one third thing, which of course we've all heard about. We've heard about it so much for the last you know 10, 15 years, but essentially one third, the, the developments when they're redeveloped are one third public housing people, one third market rate rents, whatever that is, and one third affordable, what, affordable housing, right? right. Or uh, actually sales, I guess, in, in some cases. When well, they there, can. there can be affordable and market rate sales, sales and yeah. rentals. But th those are the sort of the three buckets that, right. that people fall into. And 
he essentially told you that we don't think it's working. He did. Uh, Charles Woodyard has a real estate background, which is what I suspect lured him to or impelled Mayor Emanuel to bring him to Chicago to mm -hmm. broker real estate deals. Mm -hmm. And the one-third, one-third, one-third model was not something that was tested. There's no social science research around it. It just sounded like a good thing to CHA in a way to make, you know, for them it was about, decon they will tell you it was about deconcentrating poverty right, right. and it's about poor people and well-off people who should live together and live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And you know we've seen lots of different <laughs> ways this mix is playing out, and lots of different develop de mm -hmm. developments in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But when I did talk to Woodyard shortly after he came into this position, you know I asked, you know pressed him on that, and and he, you know to my surprise, said, well you know we need to take another look at this. Mm -hmm. And then another CHA official said that to me in another story that I did that, you know maybe some places a little bit more public housing can work and maybe a little bit more affordable in some places and that's not necessarily a bad thing no because no. CHA was so intent on this one-third 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 yeah. but when you look at some of the numbers it's not playing out to that exactly is there is there one square acre in Chicago where one-third 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 ever actually was achieved do, you, do either of you know it was achieved in West Haven well, that was a different mix, though. That was 50-50, right? That was, um, and that was a court-mandated process yeah. that kind yeah. of forced the CHA's hand in terms of which former Horner residents were allowed to move back to West they Haven. They did have a, there are lawsuits that have. We should yeah. just say West yeah. Haven is. Uh, former Henry yes. Horner's. A United Center area. This right, is, right. the, of course, the area made famous by, you know, Alex Kotlowitz's right, book, uh, right. There Are No Children are no Here, children. Yeah. Um, and the subsequent movie with Oprah Winfrey uh, starring um, as the, the mom in, in Henry Horner. Mm -hmm. um, much of that area has been redeveloped um, according to a consent decree that's um, one of these very complicated public housing yeah. um, scenarios. It doesn't have just two sides, it actually has mm -hmm. Four, um, if I'm counting them correctly. I, I, I guess but, it, but, but, but there's no. also one thing to note too that none of these developments are completed. Like they're still right. in their phases. So mm -hmm. we can't truly assess what's been achieved because of slowdown in the housing market. Mm -hmm. um, CHA has had to be creative as well and right. maybe turn some units into rental where maybe they were thinking this could go as. You could sell it. Sell it. You yeah. know, right. Park. Yeah. if you look at Park Boulevard, which is the old um, stateway homes along the State Street Corridor, mm -hmm. there's affordable housing and public housing. These are rentals. There's no market rate. But then if you add the market rate homeowners, then you do have a one-third mix. But I think asking, well, how come there aren't rentals? You know, is it does it have to be home ownership? Can yeah. it be rentals? Yeah. It, I, I think it's really important to sort of pause here and say it's very easy to be cynical to look back at this and say oh can you believe you know this one size fits all nonsense but public housing is an intractable issue that no one has found any solutions to in you know 50 years and you you can't really blame the city and I, I think Mayor Daley uh, deserved some credit for acknowledging the fact that that the CHA was a was a horrific warehousing of poor people and that it needed radical change it's just that when you start getting into the radical change it well it, it gets bogged down quickly th there's two things there the, Mayor Daley was a very successful politician and he was faced with a political problem he had half of the people in the city wanting to tear the buildings down because they thought the residents were welfare queens living in high-rise palaces mm -hmm. and the other half <laughs> of the city wanting yeah. to tear the buildings down because they felt the residents were incarcerated victims um, right. oppressed by you know a cruel um, uh, uh, government bureaucracy. Beautifully put, Ethan. Yes. Beautifully put. <laughs> I never, I, that, that, you know, I've read just about everything that's been said, and that, that puts that in, that puts it in a very good perspective, yeah. Presented with that dilemma, mm -hmm. the consensus point is... Like a good politician. Tear the buildings down, or look weak. That's, mm -hmm. those are the choices. If you don't respond to your constituency that way, you look like you're not taking care right, of a problem. Right. If you mm -hmm. take that first step and do the demolition, and then think about what's going to happen later, <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a politician's approach to the issue, and I think that's 
as with many things where Mayor Emanuel has kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, felt Mayor Daly's legacy deposited in his, his lap. His shadow. Yeah. 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 It, it's interesting because, I mean, well, uh, as we often say on this show, another one hour discussion would be the comparison between that dilemma that Richard M. Daly felt and the pressure that his daddy felt when he signed the papers to start building the things in the first place, which was, it was different but similar. He, he had, pressures that he did and I found some archival tape during the ribbon cutting of um, it might have been Robert Taylor mm -hmm. where it's like this is a beautiful new yeah. future and yeah, it's yeah. it's it's just like Eitan said. Right, right. I for a short while worked for the city, worked in the uh, I worked in the um, Propaganda department for Mayor <laughs> Daly's uh, office, and it was hilarious in a in a sick sort of way to go back and look at some of that footage with the uh, Robert Taylor homes, with the very elegant pictures being taken with uh, what was the name of that company, the, the, the architectural company. Anyway, I, I talked to a guy who was taking the pictures and said that they had a guy standing with a tree branch in the picture just to make sure that it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, but that, besides the Great. point, the the. the um, the newspapers of the day uh, in 1964 were already saying these places are going to be hell holes because the elevators will be breaking and they're in, out in the open and all that. So I mean, it was not. But anyway, we, we've we've trodden that path before. We know that. So the so the the question that that seems to be on the table for us today, though, is that Lathrop Holmes. Aldgeld Gardens, places like that, they, these are not the high-rises. These were built long before the high-rises came on the scene, and they were of a different era when there was a different, I don't know, there was a different uh, attitude about what, how, what the city's requirement was to provide some kind of housing for people who didn't have access to it. And it feels to me like that's going away too. Is this a, is this a baby and bathwater situation? So let's put a couple things on the table, okay. right? Throughout the course of the plan for transformation, the public housing population in the city has grown. It has not shrunk, but it has grown in the number of people who have housing choice vouchers. You now have more than 130,000 people in the city living in housing choice voucher rented apartments. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I've got that figure right. And then you've got another 25,000 units approximately, 20 to 25,000 units approximately, that remain in the CHA system. Mm -hmm. Between low rise, the low rises you mentioned, um, the senior citizen buildings oh, that are high rises. Oh, senior buildings are included in that? Yes, okay. yes there All are 10,000 right. okay. units in senior citizen high rises that are that are really good quality senior mm -hmm. citizen housing. All it needs redone to be. recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. quality of the redone varied quite a bit, but the, but they were all redone. <laughs> They're somewhat better than they were anyway. Yeah. <laughs> the main issue in the seniors, we can. Uh, the, this is a much longer conversation, but there's a uh, the security was the major issue, and that was solved in the in the mid 1990s. And the senior buildings have been, I would say, very high quality um, senior housing for um, quite some time. So given that CHA still is by far the largest real estate player in the city, right? Mm -hmm. Given that population, there is no other landlord that has right. 130,000 or more, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people in it. What do you do in managing that situation if you're the mayor? And at the same time, managing the very large population of people that need public housing, right. that's another right. 200,000 people in the city, right? And at the same time, the radioactive reputation that public housing has. Mm -hmm. That's what you're facing in Lathrop Homes. Right, right. Can Mayor Emanuel, in good conscience, stand in front of Lathrop Homes and say, I will refill this with, uh, with, um, with uh, refill this development with people who need housing, people who've been foreclosed on, people who've, who've um, uh, middle class families. Could he say that or would he be risking, you know, an implosion politically from people that would be very upset about the intrusion of public, of new public housing? Well, that's interesting. But, but let's lay out yeah. Lathrop because most yeah. people may not really understand what it is. When people think about public housing in Chicago, they mostly think of the high rises, Robert Taylor Cabrini Holmes, and the State Cabrini. Street right. corridor. Yeah. Lathrop is, been different. It's on the north side. It's near the Chicago River, like in between Logan Square, Lincoln Park. Low rises that traditionally had working class 
families and diverse. This was not yeah. an all black population. Yeah. yeah. And right on the river, a developer's dream, a right. wet dream for it. Yeah, right. But what I find, so CHA has said, let's make this a mixed income community. Let's do one third, one third, one third. Let's make it green. Let's make it LEED certified. Let's make this, you know, this this beautiful community. But the residents are, they've been organizing around Lake Thurb for years, mm -hmm, saying mm -hmm. there is no more need for market rate housing. Right, right. And the, the curious thing about all of this is that you have a larger community that I, I don't think they would be offended by public housing being there. You have homeowners associations in the neighborhood mm -hmm. are saying, please don't build yeah, any yeah. more market yeah, rate housing. Yeah. There's no need. And you know, my understanding is that Lathrop wasn't problematic the way some of the other mm -hmm. housing developments mm -hmm. were. And so I've asked CHA this question many times, like why do you think it's necessary to use a one size fits all yeah, model? Yeah, yeah. Because Lathrop is so much different from right. Cabrini, which is so much different from Robert mm -hmm. Taylor, mm -hmm. and the and the building stock there is is solid. I mean, it obviously needs massive work, but but you could work with what's there. You could. I mean, you, you wouldn't you have, would to have to tear everything down. You would have to change the older New Deal style apartments Absolutely. into modern. Right. Um, you know, basically take one and two bedroom apartments and make them into two and three bedroom mm -hmm. apartments, right, expand right. the size a little bit. But th it's, it's totally, the structure is sound. It's passed the viability test from the federal government several times. Um, a very difficult viability test that, let's say, the high rises did not did pass. Not, yeah, so yeah. there's, there's a substantial evidence to say that Lathrop could be rehabbed as is. That's why I posit that the real- into It could be rehabbed into any different kind of rental apartment housing, right? right? Okay. Yeah. Or potentially condos, I suppose, yeah. but it would be, yeah. again, given the housing market. Well, I, 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 an interesting thing on the um, Chicago Rehab Network uh, website, the HUD, this is, I guess this would be the official definition of a fair market rent for a one-bedroom apartment, this would be the floor, I guess, for a one-bedroom apartment in Chicago is $711 a month. And they point out that if you were if you were to hold true to the 30 percent rule that it should be thirty percent of your income, that would mean that you would have to have a, a job paying at least thirteen sixty seven an hour, or that you'd have to work one hundred and six hours a week at minimum wage to be able to afford that seven hundred dollars. So, I mean, we don't need to um, beat the dead horse that there is need in Chicago for affordable housing for people who just aren't making that much money. And this just seems like it would be. Uh, well, in, the, in the equation, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% public housing at right, Lathrop. Right. And the residents and the activists aren't saying that. Make, do some affordable home ownership. Yeah, do affordable exactly. rentals. Right, right. What's not needed is the is the market rate. Right, yes. right. And yeah, yeah. that's that's very and, and, and important that, uh, to know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just watching the clock here, and I know I'm, I, I don't mean <laughs> to be talking all over you, but but I mean. Home ownership, what an incredible concept that would be if you could get people who don't earn a lot of money but get them into a situation where they could own their own home. Talk about upward mobility. Talk about community stability. That's how you begin to build these but things. But it all goes back to, even though Charles Woodyear said the one-third, 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 you know, may not be working, they aren't backing away from the three buckets, though. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. They yeah. may alter the right, buckets, right. but they aren't... Um, backing away from it and you know the the previous administration in CHA told me well we don't want an island of poverty because I said well it's already in a mixed income community right right but well we don't want an island of poverty and that's the line that they've been but giving. there's but there's poverty and there's you know they mean less <laughs> yeah. public housing residents when they say a third of, they say right. we'll change a third a third a third they mean percentage of public housing residents will be less than one-third. Yeah, they yeah, don't mean more yeah. than one-third. I, I mean, this this gets into a, another really thorny issue, which is the, the this notion of public housing being a place where people of few resources can live and hopefully work their way out of, and public housing being the place of last resort, which, of course, it in many cases has been in, in public housing developments across America. And I look at something like Lathrop as, as being something that, what a, what a perfect model you have there. It's, it's in a 
stable, you know, as you say, kind of mixed up community that is probably reasonably tolerant of it. And you could put people in there who could, who could, who have jobs, who are, who, who are, you know. We I think it could be a national motto if there was a wherewithal to say, you know what, we understand. I mean, the plan for transformation was always this document that was changing different administrations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a five-year plan, then a ten-year plan, now a fifteen-year plan. I think it's going to be in a twenty-year plan. Plan in a in a very flexible definition of the word. Right. It's a living, breathing document. <laughs> I've been told. Well, I mean, address that for me. There are plenty of people I know, and I'm sure you do too, who would say that the plan for transformation was a plan for demolishing state wing gardens. I mean, it, was it, was never, it really wasn't ever about really transforming public housing, it was, was it? was never a serious plan, frankly. The, there was a plan proposed a year or two before the actual plan for transformation um, design, uh, written by uh, 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 Joe Schuldiner, who was in charge of the Housing Authority at the time um, and who was a hu public housing professional. And he had a, a plan that took twice as long and cost twice as much as the plan for transformation. And one of the things that Joe pointed out um, when he wrote this plan was that the whole real estate industry in Chicago, at its peak, builds 4,000 units a year. Mm -hmm. So to expect the housing authority to build 10,000 units a year, as it did in the original plan for transformation, ignores the fact that there just aren't enough construction workers, cranes, yeah, uh, there yeah. aren't enough bricks in the city <laughs> to, to do what they were suggesting yeah, to do. Yeah. So that's why I say it wasn't really a serious plan. I, I, it either wasn't vetted with people that actually know how real estate is done, or it was proposed in bad faith. I'll, I'll let All right, we got, we got a minute left. Let me ask the rudest question of all. Does Rahm Emanuel care about public housing? Would he just sort of rather see the CHA just go away? It is a challenge for him, especially because uh, the resident leadership at CHA is the strongest I have seen in many, many years. They are positioning themselves as um, spokespersons oh, for no, a this much... This sounds like the CTU. <laughs> if you had asked me a few months ago, will the teachers union beat Rahm Emanuel, yeah. I would have said yeah. no way. Uh -huh. Now, of course, I think w that we have to consider whether the residents are going to be really effective spokespersons for low-income people all over the city who need housing. And I, and I should say that I've been working with them lately on a couple of projects, so I'm not exactly an, an objective opinion here, but I do strongly believe that they are far more organized, far more vocal, and far more focused than they ever have been, or that at least than they have been in many years. On the campaign trail, you didn't hear Rahm Emanuel talk about public housing, and no. he used to be on the board of CHA when mm -hmm. the plan was, was that's being... A, that's something that gets forgotten. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. I ironed out. Mm -hmm. And he, when he came to office, he pretty much just left them alone. And then some changes happened in the top mm -hmm, leadership. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what his vision is. I don't want to speak to his yeah, heart yeah, about yeah. does he care, but I think that we're going to see his fingerprints continue to be uh, more visible, even if he's not out on Front Street talking about it. All right. Well, that's, that's exactly where we wanted this conversation to end. It will go on and on, and we will have these guys back again because uh, it's just such an incredibly interesting conversation. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can find us right here on cable, but you can also see us online at this address right here. And we want to thank Natalie Moore and Eitan McKiley for being with us today and helping us sort through this incredibly difficult uh, topic in this conversation. I'm Ken Davis. We will see you back here again next week on Chicago Newsroom. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.